Blessings, beloved. Oh. Blessings, beloved. How should a Christian love thy enemy? This is big teaching. And what does it really mean? What does your enemy mean? Because this could be misconstrued easily and used nefariously against those who are seeking God. To say, oh yeah, everybody's your enemy, yeah, they're all out to get you, yeah, yeah, yeah. Playing the victim, da -de 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 -de, right? That kind of thing. Well, first you have to understand what is meant by the enemy. Well, who is the enemy? God is light and the light has always existed in the darkness but the darkness has not overcome it or comprehended it in other words they don't mix the darkness and the light don't mix we don't mix with the darkness as Christians what does that mean you see this physical realm this temporal realm this earth places the darkness and the light close by one another well if you if you look at the nature of creation you can see that where the light is in a, in a photograph in a picture the dark appears to be most dark if you look here on this side of my face where the light is touching my face and the shadow here which we'll use to represent the darkness is touching the light where where it is up against against the light you can see that the, the contrast is most noticeable This is persecution. This is the enemy. The darkness is the enemy setting itself up against the light. You see it now? So what happens when the light goes out of something? See this side, this portion, watch what happens. Turn back on the light. The darkness has to flee, has to leave. So back to what is meant by the enemy. enemy is the darkness the enemy is the one who has chosen to embody darkness that would be Satan the devil he is the father of lies the one who invited the darkness in
to war against the heavens in the spirit. But because even though there is the universe created, the darkness cannot, still cannot mix with the light, you see? They don't mix. There are clear definitions and distinctions. And so the darkness must hide behind objects. You see how that works? Do you see that? The light coming through the window, touching my face, casting a light, then casting a shadow, the shadow. So do you see how the, the darkness is subject to the light? If I turn my head, now that portion of my face is lit up. The one who keeps his eyes on Jesus is kept in perfect peace. That's why the enemy makes noise. Look at me, look at me, look at me. Because he can't enter into the light. So he has to make noise. Look at this, look at this, look at this. Whoop, whoop, da -da -da -da, look at this. He has to operate from the darkness. So. If the enemy must work from a place of darkness, and he's trying to enter into beings of light, he needs beings of light to give themselves over to allow the darkness to enter in. Bible says the sting of death is sin. Sin is the action which comes from the heart because all actions begin in the heart. So the darkness that is in the hearts of men plays out in the world and that is sin. That is the act. So a sin is an immoral act or action that is a transgression of the divine law. It's inspired by the darkness. Now because you are creatures of God Almighty, he protects you against the darkness. He doesn't allow a burden come upon you that is greater uh, greater than that which you can you can bear and or he offers you a way of escape. So what is meant by the enemy then? So the enemy is not set up by the light. People who choose Jesus, they're not choosing enemies. They're choosing a friend. So the darkness sets itself up against the light. But is subject to the light. And so that's why the darkness must hide behind things. This in this is deception. You see the way the darkness is there on that side of my nose and the light is on this side of the nose. It needs objects or subjects to hide behind. In this is understanding spiritual warfare that the enemy will work behind you so long as you're not so long as you don't have the light within yourself and that's Jesus 
That's putting the faith in Jesus. And he comes into you. So he's in you now. So the darkness can only kind of gnaw at you. Can't enter in. It can only set itself up against you. It cannot enter in. Why? Because the one in me is greater than the one in the world. Even though I have a fallen nature, now I cannot be separated from Jesus. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. And every tongue that rises up against you, you shall confute. This is the inheritance of the saints. Amen. But it won't stop the enemy trying. It won't stop them trying. And don't allow this to happen because in this, you think, oh, you're there now. Oh, you've reached it. Oh, you're, you're there. Yep. They want you to drop your guard. The enemy, that is. Those who are setting themselves up against you in the spirit want you to drop your guard, become complacent. Whereas the Bible says, hold tight. Stay focused. How do we do that? Do we stay focused on the darkness? No. We stay focused on the light. Because once our face is in is focused on the light, our face is in the light, our countenance is lit up, it's radiant. But if we're focusing inordinately, I mean we're not to be ignorant of the devil's devices but when we focus inordinately on the devil's devices that is when our face is set away from the light and more darkness is on our face because the enemy wants to change your countenance to be dark but our countenance must remain bright He keeps him in perfect peace whose eyes are set on him, who's focusing on Jesus. When you focus on Jesus, then you have perfect peace. How do you focus on Jesus? You operate, you walk in love. You, you read the Holy Bible. You avoid insidious weapons of the enemy. That would be music, media, things like that, that are warring against you subliminally and trying to inspire evil spirits in you. Mockery, ridicule, anger, violence. And he's blurring the lines in this media too. And it's subtle now, but it's going to become more overt subtle he's using the wiring of the human brain the way the human brain is wired and again we, we don't become experts in doing evil but he uses the way that the human brain is wired to try to blur the lines so like different brain drives that shouldn't really be uh, highlighted at the same time that shouldn't really be functioning at the same time. He'll try and get them to both, he'd stimulate both of them at the same time to blur the lines of, of the human nature and God's order and how we should function in society. So it'd be stimulate two things. Like, like, a, like a, um, the human form with a bunny head. That's that's manipulating two things especially if the body is inordinately sexualized and the head is like you know that of an animal and here here is bestiality in that trying to normalize it offer it to you they started it with Jessica Rabbit a long, long time ago. You think, oh, you're, you're inordinately sexualizing things for children. No, 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 it's time to wake up. 
church. So there are weapons that are now becoming more in, inordinate. I mean, a bunny wearing inordinately sexualized clothing with a mask on. Masks have been known as uh, devices of bondage, the fetish items. So all of this going on is presenting evil and blurring the lines. And we as the church, we're not to be experts in this, but we're not to be ignorant of it. We're to be aware of what's going on, but not delve into it. Okay, so be immature. You can be immature at, at knowing evil, but not completely ignorant. You see the difference? So we have to know enough about the devil's devices to defend against them, and to avoid them, but at the same time not delve into them. Don't go Google searching them. Just be aware that these devices are in place to exact such an agenda that it will be done very slowly. Very slowly raise the temperature till it's on a simmering boil. And people are like, well, this is the new normal. This is what this is what people do now. What's the big deal? Don't be such a, a prude. Uh, did I relax, man? Just like the 60s, free love. And so there's all of this like, uh, stay in your house, pent it up, pent up, pent up, pent up, pent up, pent up. And then inordinately focus it in all the wrong ways. But what we're not to do as the church is encourage this behavior. We're not to hate on anybody and we're to, we're to draw people out of that. We're to say, don't do this. This is not how God meant it. Don't be taken by this. Don't be taken by yourself either. The way you look in the mirror, anything like that. Do you ever hear that saying, oh, your man's taken with himself or she's taken with herself? Vanity. So in that, they're stating, taken would mean taken to hell. Taken with herself. Taken by vanity. You see this? So let us not focus inordinately on eyebrows on fleek. And accentuate the things that God gave you you're already beautiful and you were intended to be beautiful for your husband not to be an instrument to draw an inordinate amount of attention to yourself and as the Church of Jesus Christ I speak to you and I remind you that modest apparel is necessary the Bible speaks about this for the Christian woman, for all women. It says in 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 10, likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel with, that means clothing, dress, wear, and raiment, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Now I remind you, to the pure everything is pure. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the beautiful form of a woman. It's the way she was born. And she grew to be a beautiful woman, a creature of God, a light bearer, an image bearer of Jesus Christ. Amen? But if knowing the fallen nature of man has entered into the creation you're insensitive to the ramifications of um, the accentuation of one's own form or the presentation of it to the eye gate of a man who has a fallen nature then this is not benevolent towards his soul 
This is not caring towards his everlasting soul because it could draw him to lust if he has a weakness there. And so long as men have red blood, they have a weakness there. There's a, a proclivity towards lust. It may be greater in some, especially if a man is a more passionate man. He may be even more inclined to lust. So it must be that women therefore dress themselves in their good deeds. They dress themselves in their love. In this is beauty. In this is spiritual beauty. And it's benevolent therefore to um, dress in such a way that doesn't draw attention and isn't um, luring and provocative of lust. Okay, it isn't serving lust. Even if you don't mean it to, it can. So as the church, we need to gently present this to people and say, this can cause lust in a man. So then it has to be the case where if you know if you're walking the Christian walk and you want to follow Jesus Christ, because not everybody does, but if you want to walk after Jesus, then his word tells you how to do so, and that's what I present. I'm not going around the streets with a blanket trying to cover everybody up. People have to make their own decisions and their own choices, and they will answer to God for doing so. That is my belief, my solemn belief. But as Christians, we're not going around pointing it out saying, you're dressing this way, you're dressing that way. No. We're just saying that the Bible asks us, in 1 Timothy 2, 9 to 10, there's a command. Paul is writing to the churches. Likewise also, that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair, You know, braided hair is a beautiful thing, but there's no point being dressed up with nowhere to go. We want to go to Jesus. And so the first port of call is obedience. Not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. So women of Jesus if you want to be representative of the Christian faith you're not going to be twerking in church with they say well I'm wearing a dress yes but it's a form-fitting dress it's it's that elastic material that shows off all your curves and you're and you're jumping around this the, the it's a stage at this stage rather than this is not the church of Jesus Christ. It can't be. How could it be? Twerking, ra like rapping, do 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 all these spirits, bringing in these arrogant spirits into the church. No. First Timothy 2, 9 to 10. Likewise also that women should adorn themselves in respectable apparel, with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Okay. Remember, to the pure, all things are pure. But mankind has a fallen nature and a law of sin living in his flesh. First Peter 3 4 but let your adorning be hidden be the hidden person of the heart with what with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit you see we know that the physical beauty is perishable it's fading it's going back to the dust even the most beautiful woman will age and fade if she lives that long First Peter 3, 4, but let your adorning 
be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit because that's where beauty is. And that can be seen whatever age you are. That's, very, that's most visible. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious. In today's day and age, wearing a dress that covers up is going to draw more attention for the right reasons. If you're focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. First Peter 3.3 3, Do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewellery or the clothing you wear. These are the things of Egypt. Deuteronomy 22.5 a woman should not wear a man's garment, nor shall a man put on a woman's cloak. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. This is the Old Testament. 1 Peter 3, 1 to 22. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. Isn't that amazing? Their souls may be won over to the Lord by the behavior of their wife. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be hidden personally be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used it to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands now one might say well hold on a second there you're not contradicting yourself is that not hypocritical but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart well if it's the hidden person of the heart why are you worried about what you're wearing you might say one might say but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart but well, then sure what sure you could go around the nip then and that's what they want to do they want to make clothing closer and closer to walking around the nip But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty. So you might say, well, hold on, why do I have to be concerned about the outside? Well, well if you hear a woman say, well, that's the man's problem. That's, that's a lust problem in his heart he needs to deal with. Well, that's not very benevolent or caring of him. Of his soul. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. So they dressed modestly and submitted to their own husbands. Their attention was on their own husband. They would submit to him and this was been this was they, they were honoring men in doing this and it was a beautiful thing it was a beautiful thing it was a it was a trust building a community building thing but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious for this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. Now, Leviticus 19.28 You shall not make any cuts on your body for the dead or tattoo yourselves. I am the Lord. Romans 12.1 I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, 
to present your bodies this is another uh, New Testament letter to the churches Romans 12 1 Paul is writing to the church for all generations so that clarifies things I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship now I personally have one set of clothes I keep them clean I try to be presentable you don't need a big wardrobe full of clothes to be clean and neat and presentable you just need to keep them clean not smelly neat and tidy and that's all that's all you need sure I mean when you go to work when a, man, when a workman heads off to work he's there for eight hours in his clothes and he wears them five six days a week right that's it so as Christians we don't need a lot because we're like soldiers we just have our uniform right Romans 12 1 I appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a living sacrifice holy and acceptable to God which is your spiritual worship Romans 12 2 do not be conformed to this world in other words don't take on the form of this world the way the world tells you to dress and be and act and talk and do and so on don't be conformed to this world conformed means with form don't be with the form of this world but to be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God what is good and acceptable and perfect 1 Timothy 2.10 but with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works that's what, what should you wear what is proper for women who profess godliness that's what you should wear how do we know what that is if every time we google Christian some you know boisterous and rowdy lady is on a stage somewhere dressed as though she's heading to the nightclub how are we supposed to know then without a preacher <laughs> well you can read your Bible that's how you know because the preacher might be offed somewhere right if the Lord allows it might be their time to leave this earth this earthly plane but the Bible remains so read it for yourself like this is how preposterous not reading the Bible is but talking about it would you go to book club without reading the Bible or sorry without reading the book they were looking at right today we're we're looking at the Bible has anybody read it no well, how, okay well how can we discuss it then you wouldn't go it wouldn't work so how can somebody then form an opinion on the Holy Scriptures on the Bible if they haven't read it would you walk into book club and elbow your friend and say give us a few points there that I can talk about I haven't read the book give us tell us something tell me a scripture give us a, give us a something what does that one mean great great she's gonna ask me next he's gonna ask me next give me something there. doesn't work like that because unless you read it in context the whole Bible the whole chapter when you're when you're speaking on a point how can you understand its context
So yes, as preachers, we teach, we edify, we even rebuke, and we expose the unfruitful works of darkness, and we're hated for it. But ultimately, we're pointing you to the Bible as the true word of God, and pointing to Jesus as your saviour. And saying, look, he's doing a work in my life, he's changed me as a man, and he can do the same for you. You can't do it for yourself. Amen? You can't do it on your own. Romans 10.9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with the heart that one believes and is justified and it is with the mouth that one confesses and is saved. 1 Timothy 2.10 But with what is proper for women who profess godliness with good works. Galatians 5.16 But I say walk by the Spirit. The Spirit. The Light. Don't be feeling around in the dark, in the world, expecting that you're gonna end up somewhere good. You're not. You've got to focus on the light. The Bible says, seek and you shall find, ask and you shall receive, knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Matthew 5, 28, here's why a woman should dress modestly if she cares about her fellow man. Are you listening now? Here's why. Matthew 5, 28. But I say to you, that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. What does this tell you? That, that you don't even have to go away with that woman and sleep with her. You only have to have the intention to, or the desire to, carry that out. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This is why there is so much lust-provoking material in media. It's a weapon fashioned against your soul. Now this is not to make a woman feel inordinately sensitive about her form. She's a beautiful creature. Right? She's beautiful. It's simply to say, Sister, be benevolent towards brother. Cover up a bit. Don't accentuate your beauty. Love your brother. He's got something living in him that's not doing him any favours. Help him. Love him. Give him a leg up. Matthew 5.28 but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. And that goes for men looking at men too. Proverbs 31, 17, 22. Or women looking at women. She dresses herself with strength and makes her arms strong. She perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. She puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. She opens her hand to the poor and reaches out her hands to the needy. She is not afraid of snow for her household. For all her household are clothed in scarlet. Amen. Proverbs 11.22 Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. 
The gold ring describes the beauty of a woman. The lack of discretion describes the pig's snout. Isaiah three sixteen to 26 The Lord said, Because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, bold, arrogant, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet, therefore the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion. God is not playing around. He commands that you behave orderly. It's, it's a must if you want to keep your soul, if you want to keep eternal life. And the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. There's nothing that, that, that can be hidden, in other words. In that day, the Lord will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands and the crescents. He'll remove all of this, these embellishments, the pendants, the bracelets, jewelries, the scarves, the headdresses, the, the armlets, the sashes, the perfume boxes and the amulets. Romans 12, 9. Let love be genuine. Let love be genuine. Let it be the bedrock of your heart. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Proverbs 7, 10. And behold, the woman meets him dressed as a prostitute, wily of heart. Women are not ignorant of their beauty. They know they're beautiful. Because they have the ability, like a man, to appreciate aesthetic beauty. They can even appreciate it in one another. Romans 14, 21. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. So this speaks to being sensitive, and this is in keeping. Anything that causes your brother to stumble, not just focusing on the beautiful form of a woman, inordinately accentuated, but on anything that you know might cause your brother or sister to stumble. And you're doing that thing, that's evil violence against their soul. It's inconsiderate. Or or it's like I'd say it's it's evil after having been considered. Inconsiderate was the wrong word actually, I apologize. It is knowing better, doing worse. But when we know better, we should do better. That's even worse when you know better and you do worse. Romans 14, 21, it is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The Bible says that if you if you know something and you don't know something to be good and you don't do it for you that is sin. James 1 1 to 27 James a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the twelve tribes in the dispersion greetings count it all joy my brothers when you meet trials of various kinds for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness and let steadfastness have its have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. 
Genesis 3.21 And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Genesis 3.7 Then the eyes of both were, were opened and they knew that they were naked. See, prior to that, knowing you're naked speaks to an awareness that somebody might have an evil thought about you. That's what it means to know you're naked. That somebody might have a lustful thought about you. And knowing that somebody might have a lustful thought about you speaks to evil having entered in, the knowledge of evil having entered in. If there's no knowledge of evil, then there's no opportunity for evil. That's what is incorruptibility, but you have to choose that. That's come about by faith in Jesus Christ, and he will add that unto you, that incorruptibility and immortality, if you so choose. And so that would mean that you could look at a woman and not feel any lust. You would see her beauty, but not lust after her, because lust is like a hunger, an insatiable hunger. The more you try to feed it, the, the greater the hunger. And then what you were doing to feed it no longer satisfies it, and then perversion enters in. is a bottomless pit. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. 1 Peter 3, 1 to 7, likewise wives be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewellery or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy w women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands. James 1.15 Then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death so you see if the knowledge of evil entered into human beings into the psyche of human beings of Eve when she partook of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil when she chose to know evil and when Adam chose to know evil There began in them a desire to do evil. Then desire when it has conceived gives because there's a defilement has occurred. What's, de what's a defilement? How can I give you a, an earthly example of a defilement? The first time somebody does heroin. Their body didn't know heroin. First time somebody drinks alcohol, their body didn't know alcohol. The first time somebody drinks uh, a strong cup of coffee, their body didn't know. But when that substance enters in, when that, that harmful substance, uh, uh, say alcohol, enters in, potentially harmful, enters in, and that person their brain now knows this substance and builds receptors that will actually create a longing for this substance. It's not just a matter of having a drink, walking away, never thinking of a drink again. Because now the body knows alcohol. And so it's like a cigarette, even though the first time you take a cigarette, you cough. 
something inside you says, where are the cigarettes? Because you've been defiled by it. And now in your body has learned that chemical compound. It has learned it and it now seeks it. It, fe it feels as though it needs it in order to be complete because they, it has these receptors. Tingling, tingling, go get me that substance. Tingling, ling, ling. And it's the same with the knowledge of sin, the desire to do sin entered in. The knowledge of evil brought the desire to do sin in. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. Desire, boom, the knowledge of evil. Conceived gives birth to sin, the action. And sin, when it has fully grown, brings forth death. The product of sin, the wages of sin, the negative knock-on effects of sin, the ramifications of sin, death. And so the Bible says that the sting of death is sin. So death can't touch you unless it has that sting. Unless it can pierce you with that sting. And it cannot pierce the one who puts their faith in Jesus because they are washed. We're washed. We're not holding on to this flesh anymore. If we have died to this world, we're not seeking after its things. We can we can take it or leave it. That's what Paul was saying. I will not be conquered by anything. I've learned to be content in little or in much. I'll not be conquered by it. James 1.15 Then desire when it has conceived gives birth to sin and sin when it is fully grown brings forth death. So do you see the importance of dressing, adorning oneself modestly, living in a way that's not provocative, leery or encouraging spirits that are not conducive to peace? That's why says here in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 15, first of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead, now this is important, we need to pray for kings and all who are in high positions, that is judges. And whether, whether the Garda knows or not, he is in a high position in society. He is. for kings and all who are in high positions that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life godly and dignified in every way this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our saviour who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth for there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men the man Christ Jesus, he bridged the gap when he paid for our sin, a perfect sacrifice. First Thessalonians 5.22, abstain from every form of evil. Genesis 1.27, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. blessings beloved Jesus is the way and the truth and the life and no man comes to the father but through him God is not a respecter of persons he loves people and we must honour each and every person in the earth we must honour them 
We must serve them. Amen? We must serve them. We must honor them and serve them. Put them before ourselves. Hold them as of more of greater import than us, ourselves. That is what we're required to do. First Thessalonians 5.22 Abstain from every form of evil. Matthew 18.6 And this speaks to the one who's, who's deliberately accentuating themselves to provoke people to lust. Matthew 18.6 says But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea.